That is the reason we're here. It's because God is love. <clears throat> he has loved us enough to call us his children, to give us a chance to be with him, to be called his family, to be called his heirs. He has loved us when we didn't deserve to be loved. And he has called us to love each other. And as we've been looking at James, we've been looking at some of the verbs of James. We understand that Christian, the word Christian is a noun. It's not an adjective, so we often use it as an adjective, but the Bible uses the word Christian as a noun, and we all learned in school very early on that nouns require verbs. They require verbs. Just a list of nouns is just a list of things, but what do they do? And love was the one we talked about last week. James says, you love each other. You don't show partiality, you love all everyone in all of our differences and all of our shades, all of our likes and dislikes and, and habits and so forth, we love each other the way we have been loved. The first verb we looked at was the word do. He says, be a doer of the word. Don't just hear it, but get out and take it to heart and do something. That's what faith does. Faith doesn't just hear a word and say, oh yeah, that sounds good and do nothing about it. Faith doesn't look in the mirror and say, yeah, I see you, and turn around and forget what you look like. It takes action. It does something. And so the first two verbs we've looked at are the verb do, a Christian does, and the verb love, a Christian loves. I'm going to share with you another verb today from the book of James. <clears throat> do you have your Bibles with you? Open up to James chapter 4. I want to read with you starting in verse 1. There are a lot of verbs in this passage, but I'm thinking of one in particular. See if you can pick out the one I'm thinking about. What does a Christian do? James starts out, he writes to us, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, the battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Let's pray. Holy God, we are here before you because you are almighty and because you do love us. Father, we realize all too well that if you held our sins against us, we would have no hope we could not stand before you, and yet you have been grace, gracious, graceful to us. You have loved us. You have paid a price for us. You have shown us that you are trustworthy. Father, I pray that you would help us to trust. I pray that you would help us as your children to do the things that bring honor to you. So help us this morning to see you, to know you better, to grow in our faith and our trust in you. God bless us this morning as we draw near to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 
Do you ever see quarreling and fighting in this world? Oh, every day we seem to live in it, don't we? It's like, it's like a sea of conflict we live in all the time. Right now, one of the biggest conflicts we see is in our presidential elections, our campaigns, and we're all shaking our hands, wondering, shaking our heads, wondering, wringing our hands, going, this looks like the end of the world. I don't know where it's going to go. We have no good choices. And that seems like conflict, and everybody's eating the conflict up. And the, the radio stations, I heard one uh, announcer the other day going, this is like a gift from God, because we're going to get rich. <laughs> These people fighting in fighting against each other. I can't even talk this morning. They're going to be paying us for all this advertising, so it's great for us. And yet it's, it's just such conflict. But that's a distant conflict. We have conflict in our own families. We have conflict at work. We have conflict among our friends. We have conflict between husbands and wives. We have conflict in every area of life that we go, it seems. And we often blame that conflict on forces that are outside of us. Well, if they would just, and if they would figure this out, and if they wouldn't do that, and if they would just, and we blame it on all the things around us, but James doesn't give us that convenience. James says the blame is on you. It's on me. I am the one to blame. One writer I read, he said, when he was in school many years ago, the teachers helped him to learn something that is not taught today. Today, things are taught to us that all of our problems are because of outside forces. They don't like you, so they're the problem. They don't agree with you, so they're the problem. They don't give you what you think you should have, so they're the problem. It's all the other people are the problem. And he said when he grew up in school, the teachers taught him, said, your greatest struggle in life is not going to be with the people out there. It's going to be with the guy in here. Who are you going to be? Are you going to be what they say you are? Are, they going to be, are you going to be pushed and molded by all the world? Or are you going to be your own person? That's where your struggle is going to be. And that's where James says our struggle is. He says, it's the quarrel, it's the desires that fight amongst you in your own being that you have trouble with. This, is, this word desire, it's the same word we get the word hedonism from. Hedonism is this lifestyle that says it's all about me. It's get what I want, get what makes me feel good, get me what fulfills me, get me, get, give me what I need to maintain or reach my potential and it's about me and then I can get this and I can do this and I do you hear that I I I and we live in an I world where it is about me and what I can do and what I should do and what I can get and what I and that's a hedonistic lifestyle that comes from the desires the natural and that's the hard thing it's natural for us just that way the natural desires that come out of my heart are selfish. Anybody else feel that way? You experience that? Anybody else have to fight against selfishness? I'm glad I'm not alone. It's a constant struggle. If everybody would just line up with me, if everybody would just have the same priorities I have and see life the way I see it, wouldn't it be a good place? Go like this. Uh, some of you are going like this. You see, we've got conflict now. We've got problems. You and I, buddy, we're going to... We don't see it all that way, and so we do have differences. But those differences don't have to get in our way unless I'm going to live a selfish lifestyle, and then the conflict is there, and now... I'm going to have trouble with you, and I'm going to have trouble with me, and you're going to have trouble with me. And is God going to be honored by all that? No, not at all. Have it your way. I worked at Burger King when I was in high school. We sang the song. 
Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. You remember that song? Special Lord just don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us have it your way. Have it your way works great with burgers, but in, in life, it doesn't work that way. Have it God's way is where we need to be focusing, especially as his people. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, he modeled a different type of lifestyle for us than what comes natural to us. If you will think back, when Jesus was about to enter the, his public ministry, right after he was baptized, the first thing he did was he went to the wilderness for 40 days where he didn't eat, drink. He was fasting for 40 days as he met with God and the Spirit and Satan. And you remember Satan took him through a temptation. There were three that were mentioned. And they hit Jesus exactly in his tender areas. Exactly the things that Jesus wanted is what Satan tempted him with. At the end of the 40 days, Satan said, look, there's some rocks. If you're the son of God, turn those into bread. Jesus was hungry after 40 days. Don't you think he could have made a, a piece of bread, a little Hawaiian roll out of that little rock, you know? Wouldn't that have been good? Satan said, I'll tell you what, you want the world to follow you? You want the world to be saved? You want the world to live in heaven with you? Done. I'll give it to you. The exact reason you came here for, to call people to yourself, I'll give it to you. You won't have to fight and struggle for it. You want people's hearts? You want them to know who you are? You want them to know that you're the son of God so they can put their trust in you? Done. I'll get out of the way and they will follow you. Tell you what, you jump off that high tower, the angels will come pick you up and they will know. <sighs> Those things sounded like good things. And Jesus, weakened after 40 days of no eating, could have easily given in, but here's what he said. Satan said, I'll give you everything you want. All you have to do is do it my way. All you have to do, Jesus, just do it my way and you got everything you want. And Jesus said, it's not what I want that's important. It's what my father wants that's important. I didn't come to do my will, I came to do his will. And as much as I want that bread, as much as I want those people, as much as I don't want to see them get lost, I'm going to do what my father has called me to do. And Jesus modeled for us this idea of putting his will on the back burner and putting God's will first. Do you see that? That temptation was not an easy time. But Jesus stood up and said, not my will, but thine. You see, Jesus prayed that prayer in the garden. But that just wasn't a one-off prayer in a, in a difficult time. That was Jesus' way of life. That was his most fundamental way of operating in this world to say, it's not about me. It's not what I want to say. It's not what I want to do. I'm going to listen to my Father and follow him in his way. You see, what an opposite picture from the, what the world teaches us. The world teaches us, don't, doesn't it? You need to watch out for yourself. You need to take care of yourself. You need to do all the things you need to do to get so, so that you can live in this competitive world and excel. And Jesus says, you need to humble yourself, submit to my will, so I can lift you up. Peace is going to be missing from our life until we understand this verb. When James wrote in verse seven, and he said, submit yourselves then to God. A Christian is one who submits. This idea of humbling ourselves, of giving ourselves over to the control of somebody else is so anti-American. Although it's becoming less and less anti-American these days. 
We want the government, no, no I'm not going to go there. Not going to do that. Such a temptation, but I'm not going to do it my way. Because God sent me here to share a message with you today. He tells us, trust me enough to follow me, to do what I say, to love each other the way you've been loved, and to submit yourself, submit your will, submit your desires to my desires. And then you'll know the peace that passes all understanding. He says to humble yourself before the Lord. And isn't it interesting he puts that responsibility square on our shoulders. He says, this is your job to humble yourself. Now, don't get me wrong. God is capable of humbling you. But you don't want to go there. I would much rather humble myself than to be humbled. Wouldn't you? It is never fun to be humbled. But can God humble a person? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. You just read your Bible a little bit. We talked about Jonah a few weeks ago. How do you humble Jonah? Man, he sucked him down a fish's gullet and swam him under the water for three days. That was humbling. I don't want to go there. But God calls us to humble ourselves. Peter agreed with James, 1 Peter 5, when he said this. He said, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This idea of submit and humble, it's the same word. It's the same meaning. Sometimes the Bible interchanges those words, to humble yourselves or to submit yourselves. God calls us to do that, and James tells us how to do it. I'm going to share three of the things out of this passage that James tells us. Here's how you go about this. Here's how you humble yourself. Number one, he says, do this. You take a stand against the real enemy. He said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Well, I'm ready to resist the devil if I ever saw him, right? If he came up and said, Doug, turn these rocks into bread. I'm going to say, no way, man. I've, I've heard that story. I know who you are. But Satan doesn't work that way, does he? He doesn't often come to us face to face. And yet James says, you be aware and you resist him. We talk about spiritual warfare. Paul talked about spiritual warfare in chapter 6 of Ephesians where he said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against the powers of the dark forces in the heavenly places. Our struggle is against Satan and his schemes to pull us away from God. That's where our struggle is. There is real spiritual warfare going on in this room at this second. Satan doesn't want you to hear this. Satan does not want you to adopt this. He wants to keep you focused in the way of the world. He wants you to walk out those doors and make excuses why you can't do it, why you shouldn't. You don't have to do it God's way. We keep doing it our way. <clears throat> and then he wins. So James says, resist him. And God will lift you up. Now the context that he's writing this passage in, he started. He said, where do the quarrels and the fightings amongst you come from? And here's what Satan tries to do. He whispers in your ear. They should have done it this way. You don't deserve that. They didn't see you. They didn't even talk to you. They, they, why would you be a part of them? Why? Those people are no better than you are. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of them are worse than you are. I mean, all the things that Satan puts into our ears. And we listen to those things. He put those things into Jesus' ear. And what did Jesus say back to him? Yeah, I'm hungry. Yeah, I want these people to be saved. Yeah, I want them to know me. But I'm only going to do what my father sent me to do. And I'm going to follow his will and not mine. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter, God bless him. He stood up and said, 
you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus said, Peter, you are listening to the spirit. The spirit is working through you. The spirit's talking through you. And you can just see Peter sitting back there going, I knew it. <laughs> I knew I was one of his favorites. And then Jesus tells a story. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to reject me. They're going to beat me. I'm going to die on the cross. And that's when Peter, Peter, listening to the Spirit, steps up and says, Jesus, wait, come here, come here. Let me, let me educate you on this. You're the Son of God. You don't die. You're the promised Messiah. You're going to reign on the throne of God forever. You're going to reestablish the, I'm, I'm elaborating a little bit, but you're going to establish the kingdom of David again on this earth. We're going to rule together. I'm going to sit at your right hand. John and James, yeah, they might be over there, but I'm going to be at your right hand. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Don't you know that rocked Peter back on his heels? Jesus knew exactly where that voice was coming from. He didn't say, get behind me, Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. Because Satan so wraps our minds around a preconception of what's right and wrong that often we don't even see it. Jesus saw where that voice was coming from and he spoke it right into Peter's heart so Peter would know too where that voice was coming from. Peter, you're thinking of the ways of men, not the ways of God. Be sure and listen to God's ways and follow him. Spiritual warfare at its core is this. It's choosing to deny your natural tendencies and choosing to trust and follow God's example for your life. There's a battle there. Choosing to deny what comes naturally to me to follow the things that God tells me to do that are not natural. And Satan says to us, you shouldn't have to do this. That's not normal. That's not natural. Nobody would expect you to act that way. People, you should act. You were born this way. You deserve this. You were this way and that's just your nature. And, and we say, no, I will trust God and I will surrender my natural tendencies to his control. And so when you're tired, after a long day at work and you come home and the game is on the TV <clears throat> and just as you start to sit down, you hear this sigh come from the kitchen and you know that your wife is not feeling well. And so you catch yourself midway and you stand up and you say, tell you what, I know you're not feeling good, you go to bed. I'll clean up the kitchen. I'll give the kids their baths. That's spiritual warfare. You surrender what you want for the sake of somebody else. When you know that kid at school that's not popular and you risk your own reputation to go sit with them at lunch, that's spiritual warfare. When you cross the lines of sex and race to find a new friend, there's spiritual warfare going on there. When you witness to your coworker, even though it's uncomfortable, it doesn't feel that spiritual warfare. When you give up some of your vacation time to go to camp or to go on a mission trip, there's spiritual warfare going on there. When you start to tithe, even though the budget is tight, do you think there's spiritual warfare going on there? Absolutely. You don't have to give that. God doesn't. You can. <laughs> you, suddenly all these voices come in. And where are those voices coming from? 
Is that God saying, I want you to, to give and honor me, but you don't have to very much. <laughs> that is, that's not God's voice. That's Satan getting in our lives when we do spiritual warfare with him. Every time you deny your natural tendencies and you choose to trust and follow God's example for your life, you are engaging in spiritual warfare. There are basically two philosophies of life. One says, my life is over yours, more important than yours. And the other says, my life is for yours. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 2. He says, to have the same attitude that Christ had, who emptied himself for your sake. He said, count the needs of others as more important than your own. Put others above yourself. That is such a countercultural lifestyle that we can live in this world. And it doesn't make sense in this world's way of doing things. And it's not natural to us and we need to pray for strength and for the power to do that and for the wisdom to act like God would not ourselves so how to submit yourselves to God number one give yourself stand against the real enemy understand who the enemy is he's fighting against you and he's scheming against you number two James says draw near to God and he'll draw near to you drawing near to God doesn't happen accidentally <clears throat> it, how many of you accidentally stumbled in the doors of this building this morning anybody accidentally just kind of walked in here and said whoa where am I you didn't accidentally stumble in here you got up this morning you got dressed you came here you drove, you came on purpose. Drawing near to God doesn't happen accidentally. That is an active verb too. You draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. And we say, well, if God wants to be near us, why doesn't he move first? Why do I have to take the first move? Doesn't God want me? <clears throat> yes, he wants you, but he wants to know you're serious. How many of you have ever said to somebody, yeah, come on over anytime. And then had somebody show up at your door. And what, what are you doing here? Well, you said any time. Here I am. Well, I didn't mean that. <clears throat> go, go away. <laughs> We're not ready for you. Let us call ahead. <clears throat> Sometimes we don't mean what we say. And God wants us to know that we're serious. He says, you take a step. You draw near to me and you find out how faithful I am that I will draw near to you and help you see things you never thought you knew help you see things you never thought you could. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. How do you do that? How do you draw near to him? Well, God shows up in worship. Whew. Michael this morning, just singing that. I'm really, the, 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 the hairs were standing up in my arm that God is love to hear the voices of a group of people in common, to share and to remember in that communion service what Jesus did, what God did for us, the promise he's given to us. It just takes all the week and just focus it right back into what's really important. Do you worship? And it's not just Sunday morning that we have to worship. Have to. It's not just Sunday morning we get to worship. We can worship all week long. We focus on him. Do you pray? You think you can draw near to God in prayer? It depends on how we pray. You say, well, God didn't answer my prayer. I would say, yes, he did. He just answered no. <laughs> or he answered not now. He answered, wait a minute, be patient. God hears our prayers and he listens and he answers our prayers. But sometimes, James says, sometimes you pray with the wrong motives. Sometimes you ask God and he doesn't give it to you because you've got the wrong heart. You need to line your heart up with God's heart. So what do we pray for? Do we pray for ourselves? Do we pray for others? 
Do we pray for my will? Do we pray for God's will? God, I want your will to be done. That's what Jesus prayed. And if I want to follow his example, that's the life I need to live too. And so I sacrifice my natural desires so I can experience intimacy with God. And that's what I want. And then James shares with us some very harsh language right here at the end of this passage. He says, come near to God and you come near to you. And then he says, wash your hands. Okay. You sinners. And purify your hearts. You sinners, you double-minded. Ouch, ouch, ouch. These are painful words. And yet, he says, here's what you need to do, Christians. You don't just give mental assent and say, God's good and God's ways are good, fine, and then nice. And we talk about love and this kind of fluffy sort of world. He says, you need to do something. John said it this way. John, 1 John chapter 3, he said, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called his children. And that's what we are. He says, but everyone, he didn't leave anybody out. He says, everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself in order to bring honor to God. And so it's not enough just to regret the bad junk in my life. I need to remove the junk in my life. I need to do something about it. I need to be passionate enough about it to take action about it. This is why prostitutes, tax collectors, what they called sinners, were coming to Jesus and being added to the kingdom before the religious people, the religious leaders ever did. Because the religious leaders, the religious people, were afraid to admit all the junk in their life. And the key to submitting is admitting that we need to submit. It's admitting that I can't do this on my own. It's admitting that I am full of junk. It's admitting that I do have a selfish, sinful nature. It's admitting that I must have a savior or else I have no hope. The problem with submitting is admitting that I've got this junk in my life, in my heart. Admitting that I fight so much with other people and I'm so disagreeable sometimes because I'm really more self-absorbed than I think I am. I'm more concerned with me than I am with you. And that's, I need to deal with that. Anybody else with me? I need to deal with that. We need to deal with that as God's people. We don't just wear the adjective Christian, we're going to be Christians. And Christians do this. They purify. Church is a place where we come and we should engage the struggle that we're in. Because every one of us are in a struggle. Different struggles, but struggles. Every one of us deal with the sin nature. Every one of us deal with our own wills and our own wants and our own desires. And he says, that's where the struggle is. And you come together and you engage in the struggle together and you pray for each other and you lift each other up and you hold each other accountable and you love on each other through all the junk and draw near to me. And the world looks at the church then and goes, oh, that's not what I thought it was. I thought the world, I thought the church was this group of people sitting in this building and they go, we are so good. And they're so bad, and we're so good. That's not what God calls us to be, is it? We know where we're at. We are sinners, saved by the grace of God. If you've given your life to Christ, and we love him for that, and that is the good news. The grace, that God gives us grace to humble ourselves, God gives us the power to submit ourselves. God gives us the ability to do what comes unnatural to us. And he promises to give us that strength through his way, through his spirit, as we humble ourselves and draw near to him. But we understand failure to submit, 
failure to turn my life over, failure to reject my personal desires and listen and humble myself, failure to do that is really a faith issue. It's a trust issue. It's hearing God say, put every care into my hands and I will take care of you. Do things my way and I will make it work out for good. And we say, those are good words, Jesus, but you know, I'm not sure I'm ready to go there yet in all those ways. He tells us what to do and we say, that's great, that's good stuff, yes. I'll teach that in my next Bible class, but I'm just not ready to do that in my own life yet. Have you ever been there? It comes down to a faith issue. How much do I really trust him? God, if I do this, probably not going to work out the way I want it to. And so we need to pray about that. Our deepest need, our deepest want of all is to share the intimacy with God. Can you imagine walking hand in hand with him, living according to the power of his spirit within you, doing things that you've only heard other people do about, and he works through us to make, to change the world. Through 12 guys, you gotta count. Through 12 guys, he turned the world upside down. What could he do with 300 who are submitted to his will? You think this world is beyond the tipping point, this country? Not with God in charge. Not with God in charge of his people. His people can make all the difference in the world. And so we pray, God, please bring the change that you want. Bring the change that we really want. We want to experience that power. We don't want to be me living mediocre lives as Christians. We want to be powerful, but it takes making these decisions to submit ourselves to him, to draw near to him, to purify, to be serious about the walk, to be serious about wearing the name. Let's pray again. Father, here we are. We've listened to your word and you've told us what it means to love you. To draw near to you, to purify ourselves, to submit ourselves, surrender ourselves to your wisdom and your power. And Father, we pray for your strength to do that because you know us. We are riddled with all the desires that spring out of our hearts and the plans that we make. And Father, those get in our way. I pray that you would give us clarity to see your way. I pray that you would increase our faith to trust you that things will work out when we do it your way. Father, we look forward to hearing you say, well done, good and faithful servants. We, we want to wear that name to be good and faithful servants of yours, not wicked and lost. Father, we want to be yours. So we pray that you would give us a strength here today in the boldness of your presence and of your spirit to be light in this world, to speak your name, to speak your presence, to act your presence, to share your love with the people around us, lovable or not. Father, guide us in your way and give us the hearts to follow your guiding. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God gives us good, good news. He says, you are lost, you have no hope. You have sinned, you have missed the mark of perfection that God requires, every one of you. He says, but here's what I'll do. I know that you can't pay the price for yourself, so I will send my son who is perfect in every way and he will live a perfect life and he will pay the price for your sin. That price is death and he died on the cross for us. He says, I, I call you now to, to accept the gift I give to you, the gift of, by faith, and the way you do that is you confess your faith and you are baptized into Christ. You are buried into a grave and you rise up 
to walk in a new life just like Jesus did filled with his spirit filled with his power to go out and live the life that he's called you to live and if you're ready to give your life to Christ this morning we're going to sing a song everybody knows this says humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up humble yourself in his sight surrender and submit to his leading and he will lift you up while we sing that song if you're ready to be baptized come down here and let us help you with that if you need to pray about this surrendering life and the strength to do that to be God's person and not your own our elders are standing in the back ready to sit down and take this matter to God because that's where our strength is they're ready to sit with you and, and, and go before God and say God we're depending on you in prayer so while we sing this song if you need to pray about that go meet with our elders shepherds of this flock to, who believe in the power of prayer and you take it to God. So if either of those meet your situation, would you do that while we stand and sing this song?